Hello, hello. I've arrived. Artist, archivist, VTuber, future man, and tonight, theoretical medical professional, or no, alleged medical professional, something like that. Some combination of the words that I just said. Anyway, Ark Knights. In a little bit, but I feel like I say that every time, so maybe I shouldn't say it. But yes, anyway, so, today, I want to keep things a little bit brief in the intro. I know that brevity is not exactly my strongest suit, but I will do my best. So yes. So, right now, oh dear. Oh dear. So yes, right now, we're going to be discussing, basically, like, alright, hold on. I need a moment to collect my thoughts. But yes, so, we just finished reading through Stories of Afternoon last time. This time, my main goal is to talk about some of the characters who uh, appeared during Stories of, Af Stories of Afternoon. And if we have some time afterwards, then I might go ahead and continue Chapter 4, because that is what we'll, we will be continuing. I've mentioned before that I have something of a plan for... Uh, like uh, text events and story chapters and gameplay events, and we'll see see how that shakes out as things go forward. Things can always change, of course. But I do have a schedule in mind for de well, schedule's a strong word for it, but I have an order in mind for going through all of the Ark Knights events. So again, we will see how that treats us going forward. So yes, today we're streaming. Yeah, due to some uh, poor scheduling on my part, or some poor planning on my part, rather. Yeah, I ended up uh, in a bit of a... Well, I don't know. I don't have as much time here as I would like to. I've got to be on my way before too long. So yes. So, most likely this is going to be a short stream. Perhaps an hour, perhaps even less. Uh, depending on how I'm feeling towards the end of the thing that I wanted to talk about, like I said. But yes, um, yeah, I'll try to be a little bit more, try to be a little bit more, what's the word I'm looking for? I'll try to plan such as to allow myself more time, because yeah, like I said, like I have said before, I'm currently house-sitting, yeah, not currently, I suppose, I'm not there, but <laughs> that's the issue, that I need to be there. But yes, I am house-sitting as of, you know, this present moment in time, basically, in a broad sense. And so, because the house that I am sitting is out of town, uh, it takes about, it adds about an hour to my commute, uh, in total, on any day that I have to work. So, I need to have some time to be able to get back there, basically, before I, uh, am so tired that I fall asleep behind the wheel, which would not be ideal. So, yes. So... Like I said, I want to get through this quick, so I'll try to <laughs> try to cover the rest of this pretty pretty fast. So yes, so that is today. Once again, I will try to plan things better so that I don't have to be in as much of a rush. Because yeah, I don't necessarily strictly need to be there every single day, but yeah, I would like to be there as many days as I can, you know, so as to fulfill my obligations as house sitter. But yeah, um, and yeah, I do, yeah, tomorrow we are expecting it to be rather cold, as I understand it, and that's the main reason why they want me there on cold days, to make sure that the pipes don't freeze, because that's a, a big, a big deal, as I understand it. I've never experienced it myself, but that's an aside, and <laughs> we don't have time for that. So, schedule. Tonight, Arc Nights. Tomorrow, we should be seeing some more... Uh, VA, or er, nope, hold on, wrong game. Coffee Talk with Sheppy Sheps, potentially the last part of Coffee Talk, given circumstances. We seem to be getting pretty close to the end of this uh, first arc. There is, of course, a sequel to Coffee Talk that is currently out, but as I understand it, we're not planning on doing that one immediately. Uh, we're certainly, as I understand it, we're currently thinking about taking a little bit of a break, though I don't uh, know for sure if we've established if that's going to be a break from doing collabs entirely, or just a break from doing these uh, visual novel-themed collabs. 
Yeah, I should mention that the collab is with Sheppy Sheps, of course. The wonderful longtime friend of the channel. But yes. So we'll be taking a little break after potentially this this Wednesday. And so we'll we'll sort of see how that turns out. Again, we need to uh, discuss it a little bit more to iron out our exact plans. But yeah, I, I can say with a reasonable amount of confidence that we're probably not going to be picking up Coffee Talk as our next game. I think we're going for Coffee Talk 2 as our next game. As I understand it, we're planning on doing something else. Yes, so that is tomorrow. Then, let's see. So I'm not going to have... Yeah, I'm not going to have another good opportunity to stream through the rest of this week. I'm going to have several mm, okay to somewhat poor opportunities to stream, perhaps. But most likely, most likely the Wednesday stream will be the last one that we do this, this, uh, yeah, the last one that we do this week. So yes, all that being said, it's time to not quite play Ark Knights, but it's time to talk about Ark Knights. Bum. So yes, so like I said, I want to spend a little bit of time doing something that we used to do quite a bit. Doing something that we used to do quite a bit. Whoop, hold on. I just said we're not playing Ark Knights. Hold on. Oh dear. There we go. So yeah, it it was once upon a time my habit to devote a certain amount of time each stream to talking a little bit about the different operators, sort of their personal stories and all that, being a topic that is uh, of interest to me. And so yeah, so I sort of uh, <clears throat> unintentionally dropped that after a certain point because I didn't really have a, didn't have a whole lot of time to uh, devote to it. But today I went and I spent a whole bunch of time, a whole bunch of time getting prepared. I spent almost, uh, yeah, probably, definitely the majority of the free time that I had today <laughs> getting, uh, getting some stuff ready for this. So tonight we're going to be talking about, like I said, a few characters that were featured in Stories of Afternoon. And if, you know, I'm not going to rush myself, but if we do get through this quickly, we might also see uh, a little bit of gameplay of Chapter 4. Sit. But don't plan on it. But yes. So, like I said, we're going to be talking about characters. And the first of those characters that we're going to be talking about is Kaobe. But yes, Kaobe is a fun character. I like her a lot. But yes, so, hmm, my setup isn't quite as convenient as, it, as I uh, <laughs> had envisioned it being at this point. I got a, I spent a whole lot of time uh, getting things set up in a very specific way, and now I'm realizing that, uh, now I'm realizing that the specific way that I have things set up only really works if I have two monitors, which I uh, don't currently, or at least if I had two monitors outputting from my laptop. So uh, I had hoped to, you know, be able to gesture around and all that, but oh well. You're just going to have to look at the static image of Kaobe while I talk. So yes, so Kaobe is an operator. She is a caster. But yeah, she is a uh, peril, which means that she is based on the dog. And the specific dog that she is based on is Cerberus from Greek mythology. But yes. <coughs> yeah, there's a lot of sort of three uh, a lot of uh, the motif of three repeated through her character I guess maybe not a lot there's two instances that I uh, am aware of but yeah I feel like for the sake of transparency I should be clear that uh, most of this information is basically just just from the wiki I just read it off of the wiki off of their uh, summarized from their like various uh, their profiles and their dialogue lines and the trivia section and all that. But yeah, some of it is supplemented by my own uh, vague recollections of lore that I may or may not have read at some point. But uh, that is the bulk of it. But yes, so once again, Kaobe, Caster, Arrow, Dog, Cerberus. 
Yeah, one thing that you might uh, notice about Kayabe is that she's got a whole lot of weapons on her. But yeah, I think that's... Let's see. This one here... Let me get a uh, tool to uh, draw it. Draw on it, perhaps even. But yeah, this... Eh, that's not a great color. That doesn't stand out very well. Let's get us a nice blue. But yeah, so this implement right here, that might just be one weapon, one long weapon. In fact, yeah, I'm pretty confident it is looking at it a little bit closer with the, uh, the straps here and here. Yeah, those match up pretty well. So yes, so that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and is this i don't think that spear the spear the angle of the spear is pretty similar to some of these but it's not quite i might also be measuring the angle a little bit wrong but or tracing it out i suppose more so than measuring it yeah it doesn't quite seem to match up with any of these weapons i've already lost count so let me go over again one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine whole weapons, and that's three threes. But yes, uh, speaking of three threes, Kaobe's birthday is March 3rd, the third day of the third month. <coughs> but yes, so another uh, reference to her origins uh, be being based on Cerberus are her fondness for honey cakes. That is a part of some ancient Greek funeral customs, as I understand it, where, uh, whoop. yes, wherein uh, the the deceased were given a honey cake to uh, to uh, be given to Cerberus, basically, when they arrived in the underworld. Yes, in the hopes that they would uh, placate the the guard dog. Yes. So, talk a little bit about uh, Kaobe. Yeah, once again, this is mostly just me going over uh, going over information that is available in her operator profile. But yeah, I don't think we've talked about those very much before. You know, I've shown you the screen where you can see some of the information about operators, but I haven't gone over sort of the... I've gone over the parts of it that are relevant to gameplay in uh, a certain amount of detail, but not a whole lot of the others. <clears throat> I suppose we might at some point, but we don't have time for that right now. But yes, so once again, just sort of as a recap of Kaobe's story, she is an individual who uh, was gifted an axe with her name on it, and uh, presumably that happened at quite a young age. I can only imagine what her childhood must have been like, not knowing what her name was until she was given an axe, but even then she didn't know what her name was because she couldn't read the script on it. But yeah, I don't know if it's for sh if we know for sure whether or not Kaobe can read at all or if it's just that she can't uh, can't read uh, the script used in Minos which is very possible um, yeah I don't know if it's that she can't read at all I know that I saw a reference to her uh, to the uh, some folks at Rhodes Island hoping that they could improve her literacy but yeah, I don't know for sure if we know for sure if she can or cannot read. But yes, anyway. So, having learned about the, or having been given this axe, she decided to go and seek out someone who could read it, read the lettering on it, and reveal to her what her name was. And so, along the, along the way, she got into a great many scrapes and scuffles. She's a pretty decent sort, Kaobe. She's a nice girl. But uh, she does like things. She likes things like weapons, as you can tell, and she likes things like uh, food, if you can recall. And so she would often get into fights over both of those things, given her nomadic lifestyle, having no no uh, consistent source of either. Yeah, a fun thing that I that I noted about her sword collection or her weapon collection. There's more than just swords here. But yes, about her weapon collection, uh, her habit of collecting weapons, I suppose I should say, 
is that is something of an instinct for her. Uh, we'll get into it a little bit more. But yes, but uh, it's sort of an instinct of hers to want to acquire new weapons. And so she acquired quite a few over the course of her journey. Yeah, again, according to her profile, and I quote, <clears throat> Though she tried to suppress those impulses and use peaceful methods to obtain weapons, the outcomes would often greatly differ from her expectations. Sometimes she would rescue others. Sometimes she would injure them. Some, some would reward her with weapons for completing tasks for them. Some would use weapons to try to lure her, while others would gift her, them to her with no strings attached. Yeah, she's very much, uh, very much like an RPG protagonist in that way. But yes, so having traveled quite a ways, she was she's described as having gone far to the east, though so, presumably that would be somewhere like Yan or Higashi. I wanted to show a map of Terra, of what we know of Terra, to sort of illustrate this point a little bit better, but I couldn't. Uh, I ran out of time to find a good one, basically. <clears throat> so we're just going to have to use your imagination and imagine someone walking basically the most of the, the breadth of, like, Eurasia or something like that. Try someone trying to go the majority of the breadth of Eurasia trying to find Greece and stopping, being stopped somewhere probably in China, to uh, be told, uh, you're going the wrong way. And so she did, did turn around, and she made her way back to the to the west, whereupon uh, in Lethanian, she was uh, met by Rhodes Island. Um, specifically, it was a team that was led by Fang, apparently. Yeah, I don't remember if we had read that in Stories of Afternoon, but I read it in her profile. But yes, she was met with a Rhodes Island team led by Fang, who uh, she confronted them trying to get supplies. They uh, retaliated and were able to subdue and capture her and bring her back to Rhodes Island for treatment. But yes, as you can see, you should be able to see pretty well. She has very noticeable uh, oropathy lesions right here. Uh, I don't know if there are any others that are visible on her. It looks like not. Uh, at least not any that are visible right now. Yes, again, according to her medical report, they are mostly visible on her trunk, so her torso area. Wait, the circle I just drew there. But yes. Anyway. But yes. So, because of her long period of time without treatment, uh, she's basically in pretty bad shape despite being you know relatively relatively sprightly and energetic still she is definitely uh or she is described as being having a case of oropathy that is progressing quickly and uh is generally again pretty the yeah the prognosis is not uh optimistic unfortunately yes they can do quite a bit at Rhodes Island, though, so we shouldn't worry too much for her. But yes, so, getting back to her weapons and the specifics thereof, like I said, she is a caster. <laughs> the spell that she likes to cast is throw weapon at person, and she's very good at it. She's quite good at it. But yes, she actually has a unique, sort of unique type of arts in which she is able to empower her weapons with certain, uh, you know, certain energies and uh, make them more effective in certain yeah, make them more effective in that way like I mentioned she had sort of a instinct that drove her to collect weapons and this was a result of her arts that she developed as a result of her oropathy but yeah sort of on some level some part of her recognizes that uh, she can use her abilities to make the weapons stronger and her, uh, her arts also interact with specific weapons in, or, yeah, interact with different weapons in unique and specific ways. So, she's not only just wanting to get, get weapons, she sort of can see a weapon and, like, use a weapon and affect it in a specific way. And not every weapon is appropriate. But, yeah, different weapons give her different effects, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But yes, 
So yeah, it's described as enchanting her weapons. This is, uh, it's not something that, uh, like she can't enchant a weapon and then hand it to someone else to use. It is specifically when it is in her hands that it has these powers. But, um, yeah, the, she doesn't have great control over that. The, you know, like I said, it is mostly instinctive for her. She just sort of picks a weapon and if it's appropriate, it gets some sort of power like it does, uh, you know, it might be imbued with fire or ice or uh, earth, apparently. Rock. But yes. Some quotes from Kaobe, A's uh, dialogue. <clears throat> I'm super strong. Forget one bad guy. I can take on a hundred at once. Uh, maybe a hundred is too much. But uh, 99 is no problem. Mm-hmm. So, this is where I started from. Oh. Oh, then where did I go before you caught me? And where did you catch me? Can you find it all on this map? There's a whole bunch of bad guys out there, and my friends won't always be around. That's why the more weapons I have, the more power I have. Isn't that right? Hey, can you stuff another hammer back there? And a javelin, too. Those are super useful. Huh? Don't say no to me. But yes. As we saw in that event, uh, Kaobe is is uh, particularly close to Vulcan. Yeah, she's particularly close to Vulcan and trusts Vulcan quite a bit. Vulcan being the smith who sort of repaired her gear and uh, more specifically being a person who is from Minos and thus was able to read the axe and sort of name Kaobe. Yes. Kaobe treats uh, Vulcan with a great deal of respect and trust and uh, it is noted that she is one of the, I believe, only two people that Kaobe is willing to set her weapon, her stash of weapons down entirely around. The other person being, of course, the main, the main character, the Doctor. Now, I say of course, but uh, it's not necessarily a given. But yeah, it's very common in uh, gacha games for the main character to be universally beloved and trusted. But not every Arknights operator necessarily likes the main character. Not every Arknights operator necessarily likes the Doctor. We'll get into some of the exceptions down the line, I think. Or, well, we definitely will. We definitely will, but it'll be a while. So yes. So to talk a little bit about Kaobe's uh, abilities in gameplay. Like I mentioned, she is a caster. She is what's called a core caster, which is sort of the basic caster. You can think of it as such anyway. Yeah, they're a single target and, you know, relatively, relatively without gimmick. But yes, Kaobe, however, is known, is uh, pretty gimmicky. She's got a lot of different abilities that uh, interact with the game in some, in, in some interesting ways. Uh, more specifically, she has three skills because she, she is a six star. And uh, once she is promoted to Elite 2, she has access to six, to three different skills. But yeah. The first of them is Really Hot Knives. I should mention that all of these skills have their names written out in quotation marks, implying that this is literally what Kaobe is calling them, as opposed to a description of their effect or whatnot. But yes, so Really Hot Knives allows her to attack faster, which synergizes well with one of her talents, which is called uh, Thresher. Yeah, Thresher is a talent that causes her to deal extra damage to enemies that she hits uh, based on their defense, a percentage of their defense. And that percentage goes up as she is improved. But yes, so Really Hot Knives allows Kaobe to attack at a much faster rate. I don't quite have the... I forgot to write down the numbers for this, unfortunately. <laughs> so I don't have them in front of me, but... but yeah, it allows her to attack... Uh, attack... Yeah, attack faster... It allows her to attack faster, and while it is active, it also causes her to prioritize enemies with the highest defense. So whichever enemy is within range of her that has the highest defense, that is the enemy that she will attack. And so again, combined with the speed, it really is good for triggering Thresher, because that is applied to every single attack, and since it is based off of the enemy's defense rather than on any of Kaobe's stats, just getting more attacks out there will be even better. 
And again, since she is a caster, she does arch damage anyway, which ignores defense. So again, very good. Her first skill in particular is very good for attacking enemies with high defense. But yes, her second, or, or rather, no, hold on, my bad. <laughs> It's not her first skill, but it is the first one that I wrote down in the sequence, which is why it confused me. Uh, really Hot Knives is her second skill. Her first skill, which would be the first one that is available to her without any promotion, is Really Cold Axe, which uh, increases damage dealt and prioritizes enemies that aren't blocked, and upon hitting them, binds them, which prevents their movement but doesn't prevent them from using abilities or attacking or anything like that. So yeah, so it's pretty good for stalling. Again, since it prevents or since it targets enemies who aren't blocked, it uh, prioritizes enemies who, you know, could be slowed down or stopped if they, you know, are made unable to move. Enemies that are blocked already, you know, can't move. Yeah, so it increases damage. Good for stalling all of that. Her third ability is Really Heavy Spear. Yes, which increases her range. You match that of a sniper, of a standard sniper. Yeah, it increases her damage once again. It causes her to prioritize enemies with the lowest defense, which sort of has a little bit of anti-synergy with Thresher. You know, you'll still get some extra damage out of Thresher, but oh well. Yeah, it causes her to prioritize the enemy with the lowest defense within range. It silences enemies that it hits, and, which is uh, a characteristic that is unusual for a caster, it causes her attacks to deal physical damage instead. Yes, so there are a lot of enemies that have all sorts of different abilities that are very unpleasant to deal with. And this is a pretty decent way to uh, prioritize them if they happen to have low defense, which isn't necessarily guaranteed. But a lot of, again, the more annoying enemies tend to have, or I don't know, enemies that specialize in, you know, resilience tend to be not specialized in having abilities that are very devastating, you know, unless they're bosses or whatnot. But yes, anyway, once promoted to Elite 2, she gains a talent called Lone Journey, which gives her a a boost to her attack and defense, or, or, yeah, her attack and her attack speed, I should say. Her attack and attack speed, if there are no enemies, or if there are no allies, rather, in the tiles adjacent, uh, or orthogonally adjacent to her. You'd think that the parts that I wrote, wrote out verbatim would be easier for me, but I guess <laughs> reading and talking at the same time is not necessarily my uh, forte. But yes, anyway. So, once again, Keobe, Keobe is pretty fun. I like Keobe a lot. I think we're probably going to use Keobe a little bit going forward. But yes, so... The next operator that we're going to talk about today is we're going to be talking about Gaviel. Yeah, Gaviel wasn't featured as much in uh, in Stories of Afternoon, but I wanted to talk about her anyway. We've had her on the team for a little bit, and uh, Gaviel's another character that we'll be we'll be talking about a little bit more in the in the future. But yeah, so Gaviel is fun. Yeah, she's very much. I think she's more fun a little bit as a character than she is in gameplay necessarily. In gameplay, she's not super different from a lot of other medics, but she's definitely a very interesting character in the story. Sip. But yes, so Gaviel is notable in universe for being very, very strong. <laughs> she is exceptionally strong and she's very good at fighting and she enjoys fighting quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, she was, that is an aspect of her that was mentioned, at least sort of in passing during Stories of Afternoon, which is why I'm mentioning her at all here, given that she was mentioned in passing. But yes, so, once again, she is a medic, she likes to beat people up, more specifically, she likes to beat people up with her, her staff. Looks pretty good for beating people up. Very, it's long and it's got spikes on it, so that makes it a decent weapon, at least. <clears throat> but yes, unfortunately, in gameplay, she doesn't beat anyone up. But you know, you can't all be can't all be perfect. But yes. So anyway, so she is an Arcosoria, 
which is to say that she is a... I believe Arcosoria are exclusively, at least all the ones that we've seen, are based on various crocodilians. Yes, Gavial's name uh, derives from a type of crocodilian known as a Gavial. <laughs> They're also known as Gariels. I think Gar or Gariel, maybe? G-H-A-R-I-A-L. Yeah, I don't... Um... Yeah, I think that Gariel is a slightly more common term for them. But uh, Gavial is another another term for them. I think that's uh, it's a little bit closer to their scientific name. But anyway, so once again, Gavial is in universe quite strong. She is uh, notable for her fighting prowess, which is a little bit strange for a medic. But uh, her being a medic is slightly is slightly strange for an Arcosoria. Arcosoria are typically sort of I guess stereotyped in universe as being sort of more so uh, warriors yeah sort of physically oriented fighting types rather than people who would uh who would try to or not try to succeed at <laughs> become uh doctors like uh, gaviel does but yeah gaviel gaviel is an interesting case in that in that matter and that she you know she is in fact or was perhaps rather yeah was renowned for her for being a warrior among her tribe uh at one point however she learned that she was pretty good at healing arts and so after that she basically just decided you know what i'm good at this i can do this i want to go and help people and that was the, basically the gist of it she learned that she had the ability to help people to save lives rather than take them as the file puts it and so she simply decided to do that. Quite nice of her, I must say. But yes, another thing that's nice about her, or another aspect of her sort of uh, niceness, perhaps, is the, uh, yeah, the source of her infection, because Gaviel is also infected. And she ended up getting infected when she uh, went into a Originium mine. I seem to remember having read at one point that it was a mine that was collapsing or something. I don't remember. I don't. I don't know. I don't remember if that was maybe something in like an earlier version of her profile, or something I just read elsewhere, or something that people have assumed um, that I read. But yeah, when I read through her profile again, I didn't see any mention of it. But yeah, one way or another, however, there were some folks who were trapped in a mine. And Gaviel went in to rescue them and ended up getting exposed to Originium in the process. Yeah, after that, she, uh, she uh, ended up getting ostracized and exiled from her home, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit more later. Yeah, Kaebe and Gaviel are characters that we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about a certain event. But yeah, because they are involved in some later event stories. Try not to hint at this stuff too directly, but I don't know. I definitely I'm definitely looking forward to that story. I'm going to I'm going to tell you that much. But yes. So, anyway, where were we? Yeah, okay. Gabriel infected and all how that happened, medic. Okay. So yes. So Gabriel is a doctor. Uh she's uh definitely not um not the most sweet and gentle soul that you will encounter. But yeah, she is uh, has quite a bit of disdain, I would say, for the perhaps more traditional, more traditional styles of bedside manner. And so yes, so we'll play some lines for her. Oh, also, yeah, play some lines from her because uh, Gaviel does have an English voice, whereas Kaobe didn't, which is why I read them out. You know, there are probably some people here who can understand Japanese, but, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not necessarily banking on that because I don't speak Japanese on stream. So. <clears throat> here we go. So, here's some lines from Gaviel. Huh? You want me to be gentle and caring? That's nurse stuff, pal. I am a doctor from top to toe. That means hmm. healing treatment don't waste my time with the fluff i feel like the game audio might be a little bit loud huh 
You want me to be gentle and caring? That's nurse stuff, pal. You might be I'm a little a bit quiet now. From top to oh. toe. That means healing. Treatment. Don't waste my time with the fluff. All right, if you really want to see, if you really want to hear Gabriel's lines, I suppose you can do that on your own time, but, you know, if you're here anyway, I don't want to have uh, the game talking over her for, her, so to speak. But yes. So yeah, so Gabriel, once, like I said, is, uh, so has a non-traditional, perhaps, perhaps some might say a uh, bad <laughs> bedside manner. But yeah, she is. Uh, she is a pretty, pretty nice kick. Yeah, pretty nice person. She is uh, actually pretty on pretty good terms with the doctor. <clears throat> bum, 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 bum. Doctor, you and I are both travelers on a lonely road. I guess that's why we understand each other so well. And one more. Treatment time! Ears open! Eyes on me! Hands up! Don't move! So yeah, so given given her uh, remarkable strength, I can see why a uh, a declaration like that might be a little bit off-putting to her patients. Yes. So anyway, now that we've gone over that, let's talk a little bit about her gameplay. And so yeah, so like I said, she's not too too dissimilar from a lot of other medics or at least she's not a whole lot not as dissimilar from other medics as Kaobe is from other casters <clears throat> but yes her sort of mechanic is that her two skills both apply a healing over time effect to allies when they are used but yeah the first one her initial skill applies to the next ally that she heals whenever the ability is off cooldown and her second one, uh, her elite skill, uh, applies to all allies within range, within range, her within her healing range, I believe. Yeah, I would assume that is what it means because I looked and I didn't see any other range indicator. But yes, they are both roughly twice as effective when the ally is below 50% HP, though the exact amount of healing that they provide is based on Gaviel's attack. And it is based, or rather, it is based on a percentage of Gaviel's attack stat. <clears throat> and so, yeah, just as a reminder, the attack stat is a stat that every operator has and uses for medics. This is what determines their the potency of their healing. So yes, so it's not just say like say in uh, a lot of RPGs where you know you would have a attack or more likely something like a strength stat that determines the power of your attacks and then you might have a mind stat or something that, that determines the power of your magical abilities you know everyone just has their abilities and they just all scale off of attack for the most part there are probably some abilities that scale off of other attributes but for the basic healing of medics it is based on attack so yes so the first skill, in addition to being able to activate more often, it has a much, much shorter cooldown. I believe the first one has a cooldown of roughly 8 seconds at base. Uh, typically, when skills level up, the cooldown goes down. But yes, I believe that the base cooldown for her first skill is roughly 8, and I believe that the base cooldown for her second skill is roughly mm, 30 seconds or something. I think I just I just said 8 a few times without no... <laughs> without uh, making note of what uh, measurement I was using, but yes, eight seconds, roughly, and then 30 seconds, maybe, for her second one. I don't remember the exact specifics. Yeah, the first one applies a slightly more potent healing effect. Yeah, whereas the second one, again, doesn't apply as potent as a, of a healing effect, but it applies it to all all units in the in her healing range. Yeah, another notable thing about this is that in addition to getting healing over time or applying healing over time, yeah, the each of these abilities is also more effective again uh, or more effective on allies who are below 50% HP. Yeah, so for the first skill, the uh, healing is increased by, I believe, about uh, 
exactly twice the or the effectiveness of the healing over time is increased by exactly twice if the ally is below 50% HP and for the second seal it's closer to 2.5 the exact specifics of it depend a little bit vary from uh, level to level of the skill but it's roughly 2.5 so yes so her skills don't increase the don't increase the effectiveness of her initial healing Again, it just applies a heal over time effect for several, for yeah a certain amount of healing for a certain amount of seconds that I cannot recall off the top of my head. There's a lot of numbers to remember. A lot of numbers, lots of different characters with lots of numbers in them. There are resources out there for if you want more specific information. I'm just giving a rundown. <clears throat> but yes, so. Since she doesn't get a lot of healing all at once... The effect can be a little bit less effective against burst damage, be more effective against allies who are taking sustained damage over time. And the second one especially can be useful for, since Gaviel is a single target medic, known in the game as a medic, <laughs> it is the medic subset of the medic class, so it is a medic medic. So yes, because Gaviel is a medic medic, she can only heal one target at a time, so being able to apply a healing over time to a lot of different targets can be useful for if a lot of different, uh, a lot of your units have taken damage, such as if there are uh, ranged enemies, you are just sort of going from one character to the next character as their targeting priority, yeah, as their targeting priority uh, instructs them, or for if there are enemies who have AOE effects, things like that. Yeah, this allows Gaviel to focus a little bit more on allies who are, you know, lower on health and still getting attacked, whereas the ones who aren't getting attacked as much typically can just sort of, you know, be receiving her healing over time and sort of start getting back up to full health. Now that Gaviel's not talking anymore, let's turn the music back up. <clears throat> but yes. And so... The third character that we're going to focus on, we're going to be talking about five in total here, but the third one that we're going to focus on is Elopsis. Ba -ba -ba -bum. So yes, so Elopsis here is a library, which means that she is based on a bird. Yes, I, oh, I wrote down information about the, the name origins of the others, but I forgot about, forgot to look up the... Uh, Forgot to look up uh, Telopsis. I believe it's a genus of owl, Telopsis is. But we're not going to spend too much time thinking about it right now. <laughs> so yes, so Telopsis is also a medic. She is a multiple multi-target medic. Um, which is called a multi-target medic. <laughs> so yes, or rather, more specifically called a... Uh, yeah, medic, multi-target medic. Yes. The medic, the medic uh, names are maybe not quite as evocative or varied as those of other other archetypes or other classes. Other archetypes in other classes, perhaps even. Sim. So yes. So, once again, Telopsis. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely a character that I like a fair amount. My notes are were being weird there for a second, or I suppose I should say the program in which I have my notes written down. Yeah, that, I don't know why it's doing that. <laughs> you can't see anything of what I'm doing, uh, hopefully, so maybe I don't need to comment on it. There we go. Okay, everything's sorted out now. So yes, so one notable thing about Telopsis beyond I guess it, you know, it does tie into her character in the story, but isn't super relevant to it, to the wider story. One notable thing about her is that she narrates her own operator file. It is written as her talking to the doctor, basically. <coughs> Presumably the doctor. But yeah, the operator files are presented as being sort of these in-universe documents, sort of a profile as you may have guessed from the fact that they're called a file. 
but yes, a profile about the information that Rhodes Island has about these various characters. But yeah, so Telopsis being a member of the, yeah, member of the people who work on the Rhodes Island database, uh, rather than, yeah, she is able to sort of comment on the M freely and all that, make some edits and things like that. And she also, when you try to access her file, speaks to you directly instead of, you know, just giving you her file. But yeah. So, anyway. So, Telopsis is known for her, for her very sort of, very sort of, I want to say stilted, but yeah, stilted, emotionless, almost kind of cold tone to her. Very sort of level and flat and speaking in a very particular way. Yeah, in sort of a, you know, in a style that would uh, usually often is used to indicate that a character is a robot or something of that that nature. Yes, Telopsis, however, is not. Yeah, she is not a robot or anything like that. She is a, I was going to say perfectly normal, but there aren't a lot of char Arknights characters who are perfectly normal. What I mean to say is that she uh, was born and is a creature of flesh and blood, basically. And uh, remains so. But yes, there are characters in, Robo in Arknights who are robots. And a lot of them don't speak in somewhat more natural. I don't know. They use their their choice of words, I suppose, is a little bit more a little bit more in line with how more traditional prose we will say. Whereas uh, Telopsis again has a very very like what's the word I'm looking for? Has a very like almost deliberately artificial I guess yeah deliberately artificial deliberately artificial way of phrasing things and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we get a little bit further into the talking about her but yeah one thing that I wanted to mention about uh, about Telopsis is that she's a character that I that I personally uh, relate to a little bit but yeah I am a person much like her who has a uh, historically and you know currently struggles a lot in sort of identifying and responding perhaps appropriately could be the term to use um, to my own emotions and those of others sort of uh, coming off as detached a little bit in the process. Again, I'm talking about both the character and myself here. But yes, but yeah, I sort of like the way that she is presented in the game. Sort of, it feels, it sort of resonates with my own experience there. But yeah, you know, some people, sometimes when she speaks about certain things, people expect her to respond more strongly and than she does, and sort of are, find her a little bit confusing because of that. Sometimes when she speaks, people expect her to, uh, do not re do not uh, respond as strongly or not care about certain things with that she does and find that a little bit confusing. But yeah, <clears throat> but yeah. She mentioned in uh, or she mentions in uh, stories of afternoon that uh, she usually spends most of her time inside or most of her time sort of at her yeah inside or at her workstation or whatnot. But yeah, and not going out in public very much due to her condition. In her case, she has uh, narcolepsy. Yeah, which is exacerbated by her, uh, her, uh, or, uh, her oropathy. Because, yeah, she is also infected. But yes. Um, but yeah, has a, has narcolepsy, which is uh, exacerbated by her oropathy and all that. Which, again, <laughs> I can relate to a little bit. I don't have narcolepsy myself, but I do have uh, asthma and allergies. And when I was younger, I definitely uh, concern. I was very concerned with both of those, and uh, so I didn't. Uh, I didn't go out very much to play with the other other kids. Yeah, and when I did go out, you know, I typically, you know, if they were playing like soccer or something like that, I would very, you know, if they asked, I would just be like, no, no, I don't. Uh, I don't do that sort of thing. I don't play sports and all that because I didn't want to uh, cause my asthma to act up. 
yeah, you know, I did have access to an inhaler and all that, but it's, you know, with or without the means to treat it, it's pretty unpleasant. So yeah, so I also sort of got to a, a point where I was very self-conscious of my own sort of, uh, my own condition there and wanted to, uh, try to avoid situations where it might, uh, might be an issue for me, even to the point where, you know, even to a point where I was avoiding situations where I could have handled, that I could have handled pretty well, I would imagine. Yeah, fortunately, as I've grown up, I've sort of learned better how to pace myself and how to be careful and identify uh, sort of asthma symptoms before they can become severe and all that, and, and allergies as well. But yeah. Anyway. So getting off of the this uh, somewhat more serious topic than I like to uh, than I like to uh, talk about here, but yeah. As a character, you know, I like that she is not sort of this perfectly emotionless stoic machine just because you know she has this uh, condition, this state where she is a little bit more detached from her emotions and from those of others uh, than perhaps the average person is. You know, she's very much a person who is friendly. She's a person who cares about others around her. She's a person who likes to joke around and have fun. <clears throat> yeah, one of my favorite lines from her from uh, just in general, I guess. I haven't seen a whole lot of lines from her be from anything other than her file and her uh, and from stories of afternoon. But uh, one of my favorite lines from her is where when she's talking with silence after Auk sort of talks in there in the direction of her and silence talk uh, addressing someone as miss feathers them both being library this could very well be either of them and telopsis immediately says to silence hey he's talking to you uh to which silence is all like what what how do you know that and she's and she you know yeah telopsis responds with i don't know that but there's like a 50% chance that it could be, you know, it could be either one of us, but I don't want to, uh, I don't want to respond to him the way that he is, uh, spoken to us. And silence is all like, well, I don't want to do that either. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so I'll play some quotes from, uh, Telopsis, including one where about, um, bum, 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 bum. yeah, including one talking about her... I don't know, again, sort of condition state. I don't know quite what the term to use specifically for it would be. But again, there's something a little bit up with her, which we'll probably learn about more in the future. It's not just that she is detached, not just that she's perhaps a little bit less emotional than others, but it is indeed that. It is, in fact, quite burdensome to speak in this manner. But this is a necessary measure to prevent the system nexus from being devoured by that other voice. Doctor, if I lose control, please guide me back onto the right path. So, that's a line that means something. I haven't quite learned what that means yet, but it's a little bit worrying. The idea of uh, the system nexus being devoured by the other voice. Uh, and the possibility of her losing control. But we're not going to worry about that too much. We'll probably learn about that later. Anyway, so... Bu -bu -bu -bum. Another line. Warning. Formatting Rhodes Island database. Don't worry. It's just a joke. Please don't panic. But yes. Anyway game audio back up again so yeah now let's talk a little bit about Philopsis's gameplay because I like her not only as a character or not only as a element of the story but also as a, an element of the gameplay quite a lot so, so yes so most pertinent to me and to how I use her is her talent uh, which is I didn't mention Gabriel's talent, I guess, now that I think about it. But yes, 
Gaviel, real quick, has a talent that uh, causes her to give a a sort of small attack buff and a pretty large defense buff to all medics on the battlefield for, I believe, 20 to 30 seconds, uh, depending perhaps on how leveled up she is, how promoted she is, rather. But yeah, for 20 to 30 seconds after she is deployed. Anyway, so now back to Solopsis. Her talent is known as Skill Aura. Yeah, Skill Aura gives a passive benefit to all operators on the field that increases the rate at which they generate skill points. But yeah, this is less than less than a single skill point per level, I think, or per second. I believe it's roughly 0 0.25. Yeah. At, uh, pardon. Yeah, at base, going up to uh, roughly 30 yeah, or 0 0.3 to 0 0.3 when she is uh, fully promoted. But yeah, this doesn't seem like it's a huge, huge benefit, and perhaps it's not. But it does really pay off over time. You can, or at least I've definitely noticed the difference when I'm using Telopsis versus when I'm not using Telopsis. Yeah, it, you know, this is not something that has a huge flashy effect in itself. But it does make it so other operators who, you know, rely on spending uh, or who normally have pretty long, have a pretty long uh, period of downtime between using their skills and have, you know, 25% less or so. 25% less or more, perhaps even. But yes, so that's pretty good. It allows for more uptime on skills and all that. Yeah, it's not effective again for on operators who have skill skills that refresh not based on time, but uh, which who gain skill points based on attacking enemies or on or uh, what's the word I'm looking for or on being attacked. Yeah, it also doesn't affect operators whose ta or whose skills are completely passive, but I probably didn't need to tell you that. But yes, anyway. So, Skill Aura is very good, main reason why I use her other than the fact that she is a multi-target medic, which I also value quite a lot. But yes, Telopsis is a 5 star, she has 2 skills. Her first skill uh, is basically just an attack buff, Not nothing exciting to write about, it just buffs her attack, which in turn buffs her healing. Her second one, however, is pretty good, uh, or it's more interesting, Yeah, it is called Enkephalin. Um, and the effect of it is that it, as the skill description says, it slightly, at first, decreases the attack interval. And so, yeah, so attack interval is something that is important to understand if you're going to be sort of getting more into the mechanics of Arknights. Attack interval is the amount of time between attacks, which, again, in the case of medics, is their healing. So, yes, so... It decreases the amount of time from one attack to another attack. And so it says it decreases it slightly, which uh, in this case decreases it by 1.65 seconds, which is pretty significant to be honest, <laughs> because her attack interval is normally 2.85 seconds. So that is more than a 50% decrease in, uh, I guess maybe, maybe I could uh, phrase it this way. It is, she will heal, or she will use her healing ability roughly twice, or a little bit over twice as fast when Enkephalin is active. Hold on a second. All right, so it's looking like I might need to, uh, I was just informed of something and I will probably have to be uh, going a little bit faster than I was expecting. So we'll finish up talking about Telopsis here and the rest of this we'll cover before we, before we, uh, you'll cover next time. So anyway, so in Kefalin, like I said, more than doubles her attack speed at first and uh, at max level, when her skill is completely the best it can possibly be, decreases her attack interval by 2.1 seconds. Yeah, down to 
down to 0.75 from 2.85. So that is really, really good. But yes, anyway. So almost all medics. Yeah, with the exception of the incantation medic subclass have a base attack interval of 2.85. So Telopsis, while she is a multi-target medic and has less attack than a single target medic, yeah, since she can, while the skill is active, simply heal so much so often and, you know, heal multiple targets at a time, she can heal up to three targets at a time. It's really, really good for if you need a lot of healing. It's good for if you need sustained healing. It's good for if you need burst healing. It's like super, super good if you need burst healing. But yes, so Telopsis is an operator that I use extensively and quite enthusiastically. And so yes, so anyway. So like I said, I have uh, just been informed uh, that I should probably be on my way pretty quick here because the road conditions are apparently getting pretty uh, bad. So. We will wrap things up here. Unfortunately, uh, I would like to do a, uh, I would like to raid. Well, you know, I can raid and just leave, I guess. So I think that is precisely what I will do. So if anyone has any raid suggestions, uh, please be sure to get them in pretty quick here because I do not have time to stick around. I suppose we will return to the room and Yes, no last minute raid suggestions that I see, so I think we're going to go and drop by Chibi. Asa Chibi VT. Yeah, she is doing a collab, it looks like. Yeah, keep talking and no one explodes. Okay. So yes, anyway. So, raid. There we go. Oh, the customary raid message is, as always, we have arrived. Uh, see you all tomorrow, roughly same time, 8.30 p.m. Central Time, for a collab with Sheppy Sheps. And yeah, uh, once again, I want to be on my way, so you won't stick around for too long. Thank you all for being here tonight. I hope that you have had a fine night. I hope that you'll continue to have a fine night every night, and I hope that you'll be well until the next time I see you. Thank you all very much, and farewell. Let us get this raid underway. Oh, forgot to send the message. There we go. Now let's get this raid underway.